We're going to be reading out of Galatians 4, 21 through 26 is actually the passage that I'm going to read from. But we're going to cover a lot in the book of Galatians this morning. I hope that, uh, you know, I plan on doing a lot of teaching this morning. Hopefully, you know, I believe that this is still the simplicity of the gospel. But I will tell you that there's some passages of scripture that are a little bit more difficult to understand on the front end. Um, this is probably one of them. But I really like it. I think it explains a lot. And um, so we're going to try our best to unfold it, to dissect it, to give it to you in a way that it's that you can do something with it. Amen. I titled this morning's message, Who is Your Mama? And uh, we're going to read out of Galatians 4, 21 through 26. Let's go ahead and start reading. It says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth, which means to deliver or give birth to. It gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar or Agar. It's, it's spelled Agar, but... It's talking about the woman Hagar that Abraham was uh, had a child with. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning, Lord. We pray that. Your presence would be with us and that I pray that you'd use me, Lord, that you'd use me as a vessel, that you'd help me to speak forth your truth, Lord, and to reveal it in a way that it's understandable to your people. Lord, I just pray that you'd uh, come against the works of the enemy, who, which would try to cause confusion, Lord, according to your word, to, to prevent your people from understanding your word. Lord, in every word that you put in here, you desire for us to understand, and especially when it comes to passages of scripture like this. So we pray that you would be with us this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, real quick, I just wanted to kind of give us a little bit of a context of what we're talking about here. Sometimes I like to write things on the board, right? And so what we're talking about whenever we're... Abraham had two wives. And so, well, I say two wives. He had children for two different women. He did have two wives, but we won't call Hagar one of his wives. Uh, he had children for two different women, and the Bible's teaching that one of these women gives birth to bondage, and that the other woman gives birth, essentially, to life. So, the first woman was, was Hagar. Actually, she wasn't the first, but she gave birth to the first child. Uh, you, if you remember the story, Abraham was getting old in years, and he had not had an offspring, but God had given Abraham promises. <laughs> And God had given Abraham the promise that through his seed, and we'll get into that passage of scripture, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, Abraham didn't know exactly what God meant by that, but we understand it now today because the apostle Paul was given revelation from God on what all that Old Testament information meant. And so the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians explains to us that ultimately what God was talking about when he was speaking to Abraham was that through Abraham's seed, a nation would be created. That's what's important about the nation of Israel is that from the nation of Israel came Jesus and through Jesus came eternal life that all nations could be blessed. Amen. It doesn't matter whether you're from you can be from North Korea. Amen. And if you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you give faith to that and what he did for you on the cross, your sins are now forgiven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you have access to eternal life. Amen. And that's what God was ultimately talking about, that he had a plan to redeem or to pay for the sin of the entire human race. And that through Abraham's seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And so, but what Paul's doing right here is he's using this as an allegory. And if you look at it, if you're not careful and you look at it the wrong way, it becomes a little bit difficult to understand. But Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. He was the firstborn. All right. We, we say that he was a child of the flesh. What that means is, is that Abraham in his own 
works through his own strength while his body was still capable of producing something gave birth another way outside of the will of God to try to bring forth the promise that God had given him. So how does that equate to your life today? Well, there's many ways that that could equate to your life today. You may be in a situation where you feel emptiness. You might be in a situation where you don't know how you're going to fix your circumstances. I mean, I use this as an example all the time. Sometimes financially we, or, or, you know, like when it comes to material possessions. We want certain things, but it's not necessarily God's will that we have those particular things right at this moment in time. We don't, we've never learned in America the concept of delayed gratification, and I'm preaching to myself. What does that mean? You know what? Sometimes you got to just save a little bit before you go buy something that you can't really afford at that point in time, right? I remember one time a preacher was talking to me. He was like, well, hey, man, you've been talking a little bit about finances lately. And uh, listen, I'm the last person you want to come talk to about finances. But anyway, he came to talk to me. And he, I, I know a lot, but I don't necessarily always do exactly what I'm supposed to do. But he came to me and he goes, you know, I bought, I bought a car, a brand new car, and I really don't think I was supposed to. Well, did you feel like a little bit at first like you weren't supposed to do it? While I was signing the paper, I didn't feel like I was supposed to do it. Well, you went ahead and you did it anyway. The point was, I'm not saying you didn't need a car, but you didn't necessarily need the car that you went and you bought, right? And so now you're going to have trouble. So now you're in it and you don't have a choice. You got to pay for the car, right? You, and so you've created a situation, but you didn't really put the Lord in the midst of it. It was something that you wanted. Not to say that you can't have something that you want, but you have to understand that if God's not, if you're not asking God's guidance in that situation, now you've produced something in your flesh instead of it being the Spirit of God leading you. This is just a practical example of what I'm trying to explain. You can do that with finances. You can do that with relationships. Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be lonely, and it's a whole other thing in the flesh to create a relationship that now you're going to be, well, for lack of a better words, stuck in for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm just being real. You, you, you wanted a relationship so bad, and you thought, well, but I was doing it according to the will of God. You see, because I wanted to do the right thing, but now you've connected yourself to something that you're going to be stuck with for the rest of your life, at least if you care what God thinks, or, okay, you understand what I'm trying to get at right there with that. So these are situations, and that's what Abraham did. Abraham produced a child of the flesh, because, see, whenever God had not given him the heir of the promise, his wife's idea, Sarah, was, hey, go lay with the bondwoman, Hagar, produce a child for yourself. So that's what he did. Hagar's womb was still fruitful. He still was young enough to produce offspring. He got with Hagar. She produced Ishmael, child of the flesh. But then came the child of the promise. Yes. See, because after Ishmael was born, God said, no, your child is not going to be Ishmael. That's not the promised seed I was telling you about. His name will be called Isaac. Which means laughter. Now, the funny thing is, is that whenever Sarah was told this by God, was she busted out laughing in the tent. Because Abraham was now 99 and Sarah was 90. Her womb was dried up. His loom was dried up. Okay. There was, there was no chance for him to be able to produce in his own strength anymore. So it's a child of the promise. It's a, it's a promise and a gift that was given by God because that was symbolic of what God was going to do for you and I. A promised birth. A new life. Hope that comes from God that you can't produce in your own self. And if I don't say anything else this morning, I want to get that point across to you. Is that sometimes when you find yourself in a hopeless situation that you cannot fix, then you need to understand that God has a promise to fix things for you. Amen. A promise that you can't do it. I don't care. Listen, man, my daddy was the best at trying to convince you that you could get something done. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, boy. Get back in the game. You're going to get it done. No, you're not going to get it done spiritually. Not in your own strength. You can't do it. But yet God has a plan where whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is that you're focusing, you need to understand that God has a way, amen, to give you the promises that he has offered. So we got a, a birth of the flesh. We got a birth of the spirit. And then what I need you to know is, is that the apostle Paul uses uh, 
he, he uses Mount Sinai. And he uses, he says Hagar is connected to Mount Sinai. And Sarah is connected to the heavenly Jerusalem. Can you go to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 real quick up there on the screen? Because I just want to make a point. Real quick. So you can, what I did was I put the time frame up there. It's about 430 years between the two. So you understand, it's like he's using this as an allegory to describe the two covenants. The two different women that produce two different children or offspring. One was a child of bondage. One was a child of freedom or liberty. He says right here in Hebrews, but you are coming to Mount Zion. It's sometimes spelled with an S, sometimes with a Z. It's a particular mount that's, that's in Jerusalem. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. The only reason I put that up there is I wanted you to see the heavenly Jerusalem, the Mount Zion, because that's the same thing that we're talking about here. We're talking about heavenly Jerusalem. In the passage that we just read, Paul said she is the mother of us all. It's from the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, that's from another realm that the whole plan of God was given to mankind. God's plan is a perfect plan. God's plan always works. The problem with us is that either, number one, we don't want to work it according to God's plan because our own flesh is getting in the way, or number two, we don't understand God's plan properly in order to walk within it. Amen. God's plan, God's word, God's love, everything that God has given is perfect. And it works if we understand it and we desire to live and to submit to his will for our lives. And so what I need you to know is, is this, is that now, now what's interesting is, is it, and we're about to get into it here in a second, is that one of these represents, this is where God gave Moses the law. Amen. And once again, this is where the plan of God came that ultimately would result in Jesus. That's because that's what I'm trying to tell you. I know I've said it thousands of times in this church, but we've got a couple of guests today, so let me say it again. God had a plan. From the fall, God promised, even in the beginning, that there would be a seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. Even in the garden, God said that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. Ultimately, who that seed of the woman was, was Jesus. Amen? That, 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 and, and listen, it, went, it kept getting more and more specific from that time forward. It wasn't just the seed of the woman, but it was the seed of of Judah, it was the seed of Israel, it was the seed of David, it was the seed Jesus yes. that, that came from the nation of Israel that gave life to the rest of the world. Amen? And so I want you to see that. that, 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 that but, but the problem that we have is, is that mankind I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself but I want to make sure that I explain it properly. Mankind has a tendency to go back to this. Man. Why? Because I want something that I can see to do. Mm -hmm. I want you to give me a formula, preacher. As a matter of fact, I don't even really want you to sit here and spend all this time getting into all this technical details and dissecting the scriptures the way that you're doing. I just want you to give me the nuts and bolts of it. I don't even really sometimes want to go home and read my Bible for myself to learn for myself. I just want you to give me what I need to know to fix my situation today. Well, it doesn't work that way. And you're not going to get me to do that. I'm going to get every time you show up over here, I'm going to keep trying to dissect the scriptures and keep trying to give you the word. Why? More than anything, so that when you do go home and start reading your own Bible for yourself, you'll maybe begin to understand. It. Don't tell me that you understand everything you read, because I've been studying this thing for a long time. And I'm just now starting to get to the point. I was sharing that with Robert a few months back that I can actually open up the Bible and for the most part know what's going on now. After all these years, and it's been because I've studied all this background information, all this historical context, all of that matters. If you don't understand the Bible, it cannot speak spiritually relevant yes. into your life for where you are living today. God's word is alive, amen? amen. But we have a tendency to gravitate back towards law. Give me some rules and regulations, preacher. Tell me what I can do. Tell me what I can't do. That's not how it works in the new covenant. Amen. 
God through His Holy Spirit lives and indwells inside of the people that have given their hearts and lives to Him. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you and reveals truth to you. And as you learn the Word of God, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to you. But man, in his flesh, like Abraham, wants to create a system of rules and regulations. He wants to... Do something that's going to, that he wants to do something that makes himself feel like he has contributed to the plan of God. There's something in us that, listen to me, each and every one of us are like that. I hate to admit it, but I got it in me. There's something in Matt that wants you to believe. I and mean, listen, I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. Some of y'all might hide on to what y'all deal with, and that's fine. God's called me to use myself as an example. There's something in Matt sometimes that probably wants... I want you to, to think that I'm smart. <laughs> Thank you. I want you to... I want you to I, whatever it is that I'm dealing with, I want you to think something. There's something in me that's not good about that. Now, that's not always what I'm doing. But I recognize that sometimes... And sometimes, dude, I'll go, like, I'll go the extra mile because, to be honest with you, sometimes I think I'm smart. Sometimes I know I'm smarter than the dude I'm talking to, but that's another story for another time. And so I try to prove it to him too, or her, Amen. to get to get him, to get it across to him. Sometimes I just quit in a state of frustration because I'm like, dude, they're not even smart enough to catch on. They're not smart enough to catch on. But anyway, that's another story. See, that's then that's arrogance. I have that problem too. All right, but the, but the point is, is that it's in each and every one of us. And we have this tendency to want to go back to helping and contributing to God yeah. of our own righteousness. Yeah. It's ingrained in us. It's ingrained in our DNA. Your problem may not be what my problem is, but there's something in you that wants to be recognized. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and so the point is, is that even from the fall, we see that in the garden where the Bible, many commentators and scholars believe that the reason that Adam and Eve didn't know that they were naked before the fall was because they were clothed in God's glory. Then whenever they sinned, God's glory left them and they were exposed. So what they immediately tried to do was to cover their own nakedness, the work of their own hands. They sewed fig leaves together and tried to cover their own nakedness. And now we know that God's result was that he provided skins for them. And I believe with all my heart that that was the first animal sacrifice, an innocent animal's life taken yes. to show us the type that God would ultimately send his son to die on the cross for our sin. And that's really what we're dealing with in this passage of scripture that that in, in the book of Galatians, that is the emphasis of the book of Galatians, false teachers coming in and preaching a false doctrine or false teachings. That's what the word doctrine means. It just simply means instruction. False instructions about the Bible that are enticing Christians to change the focus of their faith. Mm. Enticing Christians to change the object of their faith. Yeah. Enticing Christians to get their eyes off of Jesus and His work right. and to put their eyes on themselves and their own work. Rules, regulations, standards set by the traditions of men, churches all across the globe. Listen, there's one Bible, there's one interpretation of the scripture. If you find the original interpretation, then you can see spiritual applications that God has put in his word. But if you don't get it right on the front end, then you're never going to get it right on the spiritual interpretation. And the point that I'm trying to make is, is this, is that, yeah, I get it. Mankind has a hundred different interpretations, but there's only one right one. Oh, are you saying you got the right one, preacher? No, I'm saying God does, and you put it on the piece of paper, and it's the work of men to dig it out, amen, and find out what it is that he's saying. But you got churches all across the land that got all these little caveats to how you're going to be holy and how you're going to be righteous and how you're going to walk right with God or how, you know, if you don't do this, if you don't go to church on Saturday like they did in the Old Testament, then you're not going to heaven. Garbage. Lies. Amen. If you get into a conversation with somebody about that, you're never going to convince them of something different. True holiness is that a woman wears a long dress and doesn't shave her legs and doesn't wear makeup. Garbage lies. That's not true. Amen. But yet there's denominations that teach that. Yeah. 
that unless that you don't wear makeup or you only dress a certain way, that you're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. That is not righteousness. That's an outward appearance. God's doing a work on the inside of the human heart. He's changing the inside. And if we we'll listen to him, we're going to see things manifest and change on the outside. The Holy Spirit is going to lead and guide us yeah. in all truth. But man, boy, he wants to find. No, no, no. Give me a standard. Give me a rule. Give me a regulation. Tell me what I got to do, preacher, to, so that I can just walk. So can I go see PG-13? I don't know. <laughs> I mean it. When you get in there, you're going to find out, though. The question is, will we get up and leave if it wasn't Amen. the Lord? Yeah. Because then our conscience becomes seared. Amen. The more, well, Okay, that's another story. All right. The main emphasis of the book of Galatians is that false teachers are coming in and <laughs> preaching a false doctrine that are enticing Christians to put their faith and their focus somewhere else other than in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, which was ultimately the plan of God all the way immediately after the fall of man. Amen. God clothed them with skins of an animal. A sacrificial offering to cover their nakedness, to cover their exposed sin. The enemy is a deceiver and he always wants to move people away from the truth. Always. Because the truth will deliver people from the sin that grips them, grips their lives with slavery and bondage. As long as Satan can keep people in the dark about how the gospel works, then he can prevent them from entering the light that sets them free. Now, you can rest assured that sooner or later, you're going to get tired of your sin. I'm telling you right now, sooner or later, you're going to get tired and fed up with your sin. It might not happen this week. It might not happen next year. And you might even go back and dabble with it time and again. Oh, just one more time. Let me sip it one more time. But if it, then there's some sin on this earth that feels so good. Can we just be real? I mean, there's some things that I'm not going to get into all the details. Some of you have experienced some of the things I'm talking about. Some things feel so good. You start mixing stuff together, too. Oh, man, it feels so good to your flesh to do these things. It just does. Why do you think people find themselves in bondage to it? It's not because it hurts on the front end. It's because it feels good on the front end. And they keep trying to reproduce the same feeling time and again. But let me tell you something. You hang around it long enough, I can assure you, I don't care if you're a multi-billionaire flying in a jet from here to Bangkok, Thailand and doing some of the whatever you do over there and experience the greatest feelings to your flesh. At some point in time, you're going to be entrapped in bondage mm -hmm. and you're going to want to get out. The problem is, is that if you've never been exposed to the light, you'll never know how to get out. That's right. You might trade one bondage for another, but you'll never truly be free. It's like where sin takes its toll and causes such a level of frustration that the person wants out. But if then they're, they're in the dark, how will they ever know it, that where the exit is? How will they ever know how to get out? Instead, they simply remain a slave to their bondage. But good news for the believer, because God has given answers in his word, it's essentially a textbook on freedom. And that is really what drove the Apostle Paul. I need you to understand that before we even get into Galatians. I mean, I hadn't even got started good yet. Before we even get into Galatians, we need to understand this is what was driving the Apostle Paul. He's experienced for his own self bondage. He's experienced for his own self the fact that the law will not deliver him. That's why he can take a beating with whips five times, a beating with rods on his head three times, shipwrecked twice and left left naked because people uh, mugged him, for lack of better words, stripped him of his clothing, left him in the cold, imprisoned on a couple of occasions, ultimately lost his head, all to preach the gospel. Nothing was going to stop this man. Unbelievable. Why? Because God had revealed in him so deeply the truth of what had to be spoken to the human race so that they would understand. So you got to understand that when it's almost as though, not almost, God did personally cause Paul to experience the things that he wrote on a personal level. It was so ingrained on the inside of him that he had to let the world know. <coughs> he had an intimate knowledge with the law of God. But once he became saved, he realized that he couldn't live in both places. He realized that law and grace cannot both be embraced at the same time. The law couldn't free him from his spiritual prison. A physical prison for Paul was nothing. Well, I'm not saying it was nothing, but he, 
He wrote the book of Philippians from prison and he wrote, used the word joy multiple times. Physical prison wasn't the issue. He learned that the law could not free him from his spiritual prison. Amen. I had a friend before that was God saved in prison. One of the things he said was when he got out, he said, I told my mama, mama, I was more free in prison than, than you've been out here. Whenever the Lord opens up the light, he, he, the same person told you, you couldn't even give me the key. I wouldn't have wanted the key. I wasn't ready. The Holy Spirit moving and operating in the life, freeing us from a spiritual prison. The law was a temporary measure to prepare humanity for the new covenant, which God had promised beforehand to Abraham. All right, let's get into a little bit of some of this information. As a matter of fact, go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 16 through 26. I'm talking about the temporary nature of the law right now. We're getting into the word kind of deep this morning. It says right here, and now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. The promise was given to Abraham 2,000 years before the law, I'm sorry, 430 years before the law was ever given. God gave to Abraham, he gave it as a promise. The law came 430 years later, okay? He says, not... And to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So what did I just say right there? That says that Abraham and his seed, the promises were made by God. Now, was it seeds as of many, like as though it were the nation of Israel, plural? No, it was one seed, which is Christ. The word, I know I've told this to the people that come to church here a lot, but that word Christ is actually a title. It would be better termed the Christ which literally is a Greek version of Messiah, which means the anointed one. God was promising for thousands of years of human history that the anointed one was coming. He chose to create a nation through one man named Abraham and through that nation to give the Christ the seed that would, be, that would offer the promises to all of the nations. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the covenant that he promised to Abraham, right? The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. So the point is, is that the promise was given to Abraham 430 years before the law was given. So the law can't turn around and disannul the promise that God gave on the front end. The reason that he's having to go through all of this is because he's dealing with people that are being affected by false teachers that are trying to come in and bring in false doctrine that are telling people to look at rules, regulations, and add law to their faith, something that Paul's already dealt with. And he says, hold on, slam on the brakes because this is not going to work for you. This is going to cause untold misery and, and heartache and, and all kinds of things. He says that, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. You can't earn what God's giving. It was given by promise. Wherefore then serves the law? So what's the purpose of the law? That's what Paul's asking. What would be the purpose of the law then? It was added because of transgressions. It's kind of like a throttle. I think that it works for a throttle. In the waffle, we used to call it a choke. It was a valve. Whenever you have a whole bunch of gas, you got to bleed it off slowly. You can't just let it all out at once, man. That pipe will start flopping all over the place and killing people all over the deck. You got to choke it down a little bit. You got to tighten up the valve, let it come out at a certain level. That's kind of like the throttle on a motorcycle. You open it up. I don't know much about motorcycles, but you open it up, it allows more gas to flood in. You turn it back that way, it throttles it down. See, that's what the law did. It was there because of transgressions to prevent people. To make them aware that if they crossed this boundary, it was against the will of God, right? But it could not ultimately function to serve the purpose that God had intended for the promised seed, if that made sense. He says uh, that it was ordained by angels. The first covenant, whenever you read it in the Old Testament, it's not as clear, but there's two passages in the New Testament that explain that angels spoke for God to Moses, and Moses brought the law to the people. So there were the mediator of the old covenant had to do with angels, but God is one. In other words, there's always a mediator whenever you have a covenant or an agreement. That's what a covenant is, an agreement. There's mediators. Y'all ever watch that movie Braveheart? 
Probably not. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. I know it's kind of bloody, but <laughs> it's a good movie. The reason that I'm trying to say that is because if you ever watch the battle scenes of Braveheart, you'll see that Mel Gibson is going out there as a mediator for all those people from Scotland, and then the king's over, and then the king has some, and they go and they meet halfway in the middle of the battlefield. Two mediators, two representatives of two different sides of people. And the angels mediated for, for God to Moses. Moses mediated from God to the people, right? But God is one. The new covenant didn't need angels. Hey, man, God did the whole thing because God had the plan and God became man and he sealed the deal for the human race. He said, God forbid for if there had been a law. I'm sorry, he says, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. It's, it should be thought of not so much kept under the law like a thumb, more like a protection. God was protecting the human race from their own selves. He gave the law, though, to Israel. See, just as God has given grace and life to the Christian... And that the Christian is supposed to speak forth the truth to a lost and a dying world. He gave this truth to Israel that, that the rest of the world might know that there was a God and he did have a law. And he did have certain expectations for mankind. Okay. But he, and that's the purpose of it. He says, but the scripture has concluded all under sin. By faith that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came. Before Jesus came, before the new covenant came, he says, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which would soon afterwards be revealed. So until Jesus came, the Messiah, until the new covenant came, we were, we Israel were kept under the law till the revelation of God came to fruition. He goes on to say, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now, I think that in the past, maybe we had the wrong ideas of what a schoolmaster is. Sometimes I used to think a little house on the prairie. You remember whenever they get in trouble? I don't know. They had one mean teacher, I think, in there. My little sister loved a little house on the prairie. That's the only time I got to see it. But anyway, uh, whenever they messed up, I remember one of them teachers would say, give me your hand. And they put the hand in there and they slapped it with the ruler. And so when sometimes when you think of a schoolmaster, you think of that. But really and truly, the idea behind this word, it has to do with, a, it's like a, more like a nanny in, in our sense. But when you think of a nanny, what you got to think of is that a nanny really is taking care of the child, all aspects of the child's life. So if, if you're a nanny that works for a rich person and, you're, and the child that you work for goes to a parochial school, you're responsible. Many times you wake the child up. You make sure the child has, I mean, we're talking really rich people that don't really have much contact with their kid. Uh, you make sure the child's up. You make sure the child's fed. You bring the child to school. You pick the child up from school. You bring the child to violin lessons. You bring the child to, to tennis lessons at the country club. The point is, is that you're in control of the aspect of each and every aspect of the child's life until the child comes to the age where it's mature and it can walk on its own. That's what the law was doing for the human race until Jesus came. It was taking care of the intricate details of the human life. All right. And it was ultimately for the purpose was to bring us to a place of maturity. The plan of salvation had to come to a place of maturity. God's plan of salvation, which was the giving of his son to die on the cr cross, had to come to a place of maturity and fruition. And so in the meantime, the law did the purposes of bringing us to that particular place. He says that ultimately to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. You are all the children of God by faith. In Christ Jesus. So essentially right here Paul is explaining the temporary purpose of the law. Man needs righteousness from God but he can't earn it himself. It was a plan that was given as a gift from God. But this isn't an easy thought to learn. Once again I said it already. Ingrained in the DNA of man is, is that he wants to do something. <clears throat> he wants to trust in rules. He wants to trust in traditions. He wants the preacher. He wants somebody to tell us how to do it. 
don't really want to do all that work. I want. I just want you to tell me. And, 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 then, and then, like the fig leaves, we want to fix our own mess. We want to earn it and fix our own mess. I don't know about you, but I like trying to fix stuff. And I, oftentimes I get myself in trouble because you can't fix nothing, man. Yeah. Certainly couldn't fix your own life. How are you going to fix something else? Paul had already learned the dangers of attempting to mix law and grace together. If you look at Romans chapter 7, verses uh, 6 through 14. Just bear with me this morning. We're going through a lot of scripture, but we're getting to a point. Romans 7, 6 through 14. Paul says, <clears throat> but now, and he's talking about the fact that now we're in grace. He says, now we are delivered from the law. <clears throat> that being dead wherein we were held. So we're no longer. And he, what he's saying is, is that we died to our first birth. Ishmael represents the first birth, the fleshly birth. We died to the first birth. Now we're in the new covenant. We're in the covenant of grace. So he says, but now we're delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. See, now that you're a born again Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. And once again, the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you. And it's not just a list of do's and don'ts that you try to follow. And then you think you're more holy than somebody else because you don't do what they do. Or you know more than they know. That's self-righteousness. That's not the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is a, is a man. His name is Jesus. All right. It goes on to say this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. He says, I would not have known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. What does that mean? That word concupiscence is like all kinds of sin. See, Paul's saying... And he's about to explain this, that after he was a Christian, he added law to his faith. He's about to explain that. And what happened was, was that the law said, you shall not lust. In other words, you're not supposed to have a thirst and a hunger for something that doesn't belong to you. And when you do, and, you try, and, and, and he couldn't get free from it, it produced in him sin, frustration, aggravation, at a level that he really didn't even know what to do with himself. That's what I'm trying to say. The Apostle Paul has lived this. And these false teachers are coming to Galatia. And they're trying to give them, the believers in Galatia, the same lies that he himself tried to live. And it only caused frustration in his life. He goes on to say right here, for without the law, sin was dead. In other words, what he's trying to say, you just got to take my word for it because we're not teaching Romans 7 this morning. I was alive before I was a Christian. And I tried my best to live according to the law. I gave my heart to Jesus. I died to the law. And sin was not alive in my life at that point in time. But then I added law to my faith. And when I did, it was like throwing gasoline on an ember. And it flared up again. He said it right here. He says, he says, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, in other words, the law was given by God. It wasn't supposed to, it, it, it was supposed to show the love of God, the, the character of God. But he said, I found it to be death for sin took occasion by the commandment. Sin uses the law as an opportunity to get in and to, and to cause you frustration in your life because you're trying to live for God in your own strength. If that makes sense. He says, but it deceived me. And by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy. The commandment is holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin. Working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal. Sold under sin. What's the easy way to break that down preacher? You ever, you ever find yourself in the midst of a situation where you got sin in your life and you want to be free? Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you make a promise. Make a promise to God. I shall not do this anymore. But you don't really know how to trust in God's strength. And you're really doing it in your own strength. What happens? Next day you do it five times instead of one time. Mm -hmm. And ultimately you get to the point where you're becoming so frustrated. 
and, and irritated because you can't seem to break free from this particular situation. And it'll get you to the point where hopefully, well, what God's plan is, is that you will, in your frustration, surrender. Amen. <laughs> Fall to your knees in a state of helplessness and cry out to the Lord. There's a whole lot of people that try to live according to law and religious tradition and act real holy on the outside, but their heart ain't right with the Lord on the inside. Amen. And ultimately, you get to the place of frustration and irritation. You cry to God and you say, Lord, help me. I'm a sinner. I need you to help me. Amen. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying right here. He learned the hard way that after you're saved, if you attempt to live for God through a set of rules without grace working, it will result in failure in the life of the Christian. Look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 28. Real quick. I just want to show you something. In the day that the law was given to Moses, look what happened. Exodus 32, 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. When the law was given, 3,000 people died. The day that the law was given by God, 3,000 people died. Because, because Moses drew a line in the sand. And he said, whoever's going to serve the Lord, then you cross over this line and you stand with me. Whoever's not... You stand on the other side, and on the day the, those that stood on the other side, 3,000 men died. Now look at this. Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 41. On the day the law was given, 3,000 people died. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. On the day that the church was born, 3,000 people got saved. Amen. Oh, that's right. And when the law was given, 3,000 people died. When grace came, 3,000 people lived. Amen? The death of Jesus brings grace and grace brings life. But listen to me. When you try to live according to the law, then it results, then it gives power to sin. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 56. I know we've shared this before. I'm trying to really just set the precedence for some of the passages that I wanted to cover in Galatians. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. It says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Listen to me. I know that most of the time, Paul, it seems like Paul is talking about the law of Moses, but you got to understand that he's actually writing these letters to Gentile churches. What is a Gentile? People like you and me that, don't, that didn't know the law, that didn't know the commandments. That had just given their life to Jesus. But people were coming back in and trying to tell them to put their faith in the law in addition to Jesus. The Apostle Paul says right here that the strength of sin is the law. Whenever you put your hope and trust in a set of rules and regulations and the traditions of men, it gives strength to sin. But look at this, 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, for the preaching of the cross... Is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. The word of the cross, that's what the word there is, logos in the Greek. It means the word of the cross, the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross. When you tell people the story of Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross, there's a power that's connected to that through the person of the Holy Amen. Spirit that gives power that results in life. Amen. Not you trying to live according to some tradition of what men told you holiness looks like. No, what God says is holy and righteous and true. Amen. Is produced in the life of the believer through the power of the message of what Jesus did at the cross. Because of what Paul learned personally regarding the law and grace, he will teach the truth at all costs. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Paul, an apostle... In parentheses, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. In other words, no man made me an apostle. God called me to this. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Look at this. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. I want you to see that's the purpose. <laughs> This is the whole purpose, the whole plan of God. 
Praise be to God our Father who gave us Jesus so that we might be delivered from this present evil world. He gave himself. What does that mean? What is that talking about? The cross. He, he gave his life as a sacrifice so, so, that, so that we could be delivered from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Look at this, what he says. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said, I marvel, I am astounded at the fact that you are so quickly removed from the very gospel that was given by God from the beginning of the foundations of the earth. Before the man was ever created, before man ever fall, God already knew that he was going to give his son Jesus to die on a cross, to shed his blood, to offer up a sacrifice, to pay the penalty for sin. I marvel that you are so soon removed because there's people that are coming around here and they're perverting the gospel. And that's point number one. God's purpose is deliverance. He wants to deliver us. Satan's purpose is deception. <clears throat> he said, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That, that the enemy wants to pervert the gospel of Christ through these people. He says, but even though if an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, I want, you can go to Ephesians 6.16 6, real quick while I write this on the board. But in all of these scriptures that I'm about to show you, where it says this evil aid, this evil world right there, I'm about to, I'm about to write. This is how it would look if you were going to write the Greek words in English. Paniras eon. It means evil age. But what I want you to know is, is that if you put a little, in the Greek there's a little definite article, and you pronounce that hapaniros, it means the evil one. So if you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. He says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one, the Hapaniras. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. 1 John chapter 3 verse 12. Not as Cain who was of that Hapaniras, the wicked one, and slew his brother. The words evil age or paneros eon, the word paneros used to describe Satan in these other passages. The idea is, is that the evil one has produced an evil age through his fall. And now taking that fall and injecting it into mankind, he has produced an evil age. The word of God says in Ephesians chapter 2 that there's a spirit of disobedience that moves in the heart of unbelievers and causes people to go a course that's opposite and different than the course that God would have mankind to go. And what I need you to understand is, is that there's this, there's this spirit that's behind this and that is creating this evil age. But the Apostle Paul said God's plan was to deliver us out of this evil age. But the enemy's plan, I'm here to tell you, is to cause deception so that we cannot see where it is that God wants us to go. He wants through evil deception to blind people to the truth and cause them to be enticed by fleshly desires and to move away from God's purposes for their lives, to prevent them from being delivered from this present evil age and experiencing eternal life with God. Satan will attempt in any way he can to pervert the gospel. And one of his age old tricks is to cause man to believe that he can produce through some type of spiritual works. I know I get I'm reading too fast. I got to slow down. Why? Because this is probably more important than all this. 
huffing and puffing I'm doing up here. Satan will attempt in any way he can to pervert the gospel. And one of his age old tricks is to cause man to believe that he can produce through some type of spiritual works his own righteousness instead of trusting in the righteousness that God gives as a gift. One of the things that Paul said in the first passage of Scripture of Galatians is that even if an angel preach another gospel, we should understand that Satan will use men as preachers, but the words that they speak will come from another source or spirit other than the Holy Spirit. Even the slightest deviation from the truth of the gospel, where the believer places and keeps his faith in Jesus' work for salvation and living for God, will pervert the gospel and cause one to be brought under bondage again. I said the point number one was God's purpose, deliver from this evil age. Satan's uh, plan is to cause deception. And this is point 1A. He's got his own preachers. Satan's got his own preachers. It's important that you understand this. Some of you have been coming to church here for so long, you're about to yawn and go to sleep on me because I've been telling you for a long time that there's false preachers out there. But some of you maybe had not ever heard this before. You can't believe everything you hear. You can't just turn on the television and flip through the channels and believe every word that is spoken across the, 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 the airwaves. Yeah. He's got his own preachers. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. He said, he says right here, oh foolish Galatians. Now, Brother Larson used to say, when you look into the original language of what this is saying, it's saying, oh stupid ones. <laughs> it's not ignorant, it's stupid. Ignorant means you just don't know. Stupid is you've been told, but you, you continue to go the way that, oh, you know, the way that you want to go. He says, who has bewitched you? And somebody cast a spell on you. Then you should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you. In other words, I preached the gospel in such a way that the focus was on Calvary, what he did for you at the cross. He says, this only what I learned of you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you in your silly little mind thinking that you're going to do something that's going to make you more holy than what Jesus already did? There's a whole lot of things that are good things for us to do and engage in in the body of Christ. The problem is, is that whenever our focus of our faith, us thinking, oh, man, if I get up here and I preach twice a week or if I, uh, you know, clean the church a couple of times and nobody's looking and help, at, you know, that I'm doing something a little bit extra. You know, oh, now, now I'm really pleasing God or now I'm finding favor with God. OK, we should be wanting to do things for the Lord out of a heart that's grateful and, and, and thankful for what God has done in the midst of our lives rather than us just wanting to do something thinking that now we're earning something with the Lord. That's right. He says, when this happens, it's as though a spell has been cast upon the mind of the believer. They're, pre they're coming in with a whole different gospel, a whole different doctrine, and they're telling them to add law to their faith. And now it's caused a spell to be cast upon them. Mm. A spell is probably not a good thing to be under. No. I'm thinking. It causes blindness. It causes confusion. It prevents you from being able to go. It's a curse. It should be understood that Paul is speaking to Christians here. We need to understand that. Well, look at 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. Because this scripture, Paul's talking to unbelievers. But in a similar fashion, this is the same thing that's happening to the Christians in Galatia. He says, if our gospel be hid. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, unbelievers, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. How can he rise? The evil one. He's blinded the minds of those who don't know the truth. They're lost. He says, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Because if the light of the glorious gospel shines on people's hearts, you know, where there's light, you can see. Your whole, the physiology of your eye has to function off of light. Without light, you can't see. The light, spiritually speaking, also. When the light of the gospel shines on the heart of man, 
That's what this, Peter said. When the day star dawns in your heart, it's a light that awakens in the midst of darkness. It allows you to be able to see spiritual truth. Amen. But the God of this world wants to hide him. And don't think that the God of this world doesn't just messes with lost folk. No, he wants to mess with the church folk. <laughs> he, he wants to cause confusion and blindness in the spiritual eyes of the church folk so that the truth of God's gospel doesn't go forth. He doesn't want you free. Because if you're free spiritually, then you're going to start telling people about the good That's news right. that yeah. happened to your heart. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Yeah. He don't want you talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He wants you to keep your mouth shut. He wants to keep you blinded to the truth. He wants to keep you bound up in bondage so that you don't feel worthy to speak. The devil is a liar. He's a deceiver. He wants to keep your mouth shut. It's supposed to be lost folks that are blinded to God's truth, not the church. But what we see in Galatians then, and it's still present today, false preachers with a false gospel that result in deception and perversion and bondage instead of, instead of deliverance. Satan's deception. We're still on point number one. This is point 1B. <laughs> no one is immune. Galatians 2, verses 3 through 5. He says, but neither Titus... Galatians 2, verses 3 through 5. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek... Titus was half Greek, half Jew. Was compelled to be circumcised... And that because of false brethren unaware. I love this word right here in the Greek. I'm just going to write this because i got a reason that I want to do this. Pseudo. I'm so smart. It's a point that I wanted to make, though. It says right here, false brethren privily brought in who came in privily to spy on our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Privily, secretly, stealthily, like a stealth bomber, these guys came in false brethren, pseudadelphia, pseudo brothers. That's where the word Philadelphia comes from, the city of brotherly love. Pseudadelphia, false brothers. They crept in like a stealth fighter, secretly. Why was it so hard to see? Because they said they were one of you. Whenever you're flipping through the channels, it's so hard to see if you don't really know because everybody's saying they're one of us. Yeah. They're saying that they're one of us and that we all believe the same thing. No, it's lies. We don't all believe the same thing. Yeah. And, and that's what they're doing. They're pseudadelphias. They're, they're false brothers. They're coming in secretly by stealth to spy out their liberty. And they're telling Titus, you got to be circumcised if you want to be holy. Titus is like, hold on a second. My daddy was a Greek. My mom was a Jew. I don't want to be circumcised. Paul's saying you can't make yourself more holy through circumcision. Jesus has already made you holy. Do not allow these false brothers to teach you something that's going to cause bondage to come upon you. It's like fool's gold. It looks like the real thing to the naked eye, but it's a deceiver in the end. The first part, to, you no know, one is being is immune. These brothers were not immune because these false brothers were giving something that was deceptive, right? Satan's deception, point number one, number C to point number one, is no one is immune. Even the mature can get sucked into the trap. Look what it says, Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. 
insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now, do you even really know what's going on here? This is some crazy stuff right here. The reason I say that is because how many of you, before you really started studying the Bible, just thought, you see these pictures of Paul and Peter, and they got this halo on top of their head, and you're like, oh, they were so holy. You know what I'm saying? No, I mean, I'm not trying to clown them because, I mean, they gave their life for the faith. And, I mean, you know, I don't even like when people make fun of me for my faith. But, but nevertheless, you, you understand what I'm trying to get at. Like, we used to think, oh, man, they were way up here. We're way down here. You know what this passage is saying? This passage is saying that when these false brothers that were trying to make Titus get circumcised showed up to Antioch where Paul and Peter and all the Gentiles. So you got Jews that are circumcised but now have given their heart to Jesus because the gospel's just starting. But you also got Gentiles that are uncircumcised. And Peter's like just having a good old time with them. They're sitting there eating and they're fellowshipping and he's teaching them. I mean, this is Peter. Preach the first Holy Ghost message. 3,000 people get saved. Bam. This is Peter walking by in his shadow, touching people in their heel right there near the temple. The Bible says that when these men came from James over here in Jerusalem and they were of the circumcision, they said, they, they looked at Peter kind of funny, like, what are you doing eating with those Gentile dogs? Peter, the Bible says, removed himself from them. Paul said this was such a mess. They, the word dissimulation means hypocrite. They were acting the hypocrite. So much so that it caused Barnabas to be separated through their hypocrisy. This is a problem. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul's over here trying to establish a church and trying to teach people about freedom in Christ. And here these liars are going to come over here and try to instill false doctrine in the midst of the church. And Peter uh, and Peter buys along with it. And then it causes Barnabas, Paul's running mate, his running buddy, they're over here doing missionary work together to separate themselves from the truth. Paul stands up in the middle of it all and I, he oh. stood up and he confronted Peter to his face. He said, you're wrong. And he goes on to tell Peter, he says, look in, in verses, chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. He says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The Apostle Paul saying, Peter, what in the world are you doing? You're a Jew and you can't even live like a Jew. And now you're going to try to make Gentiles live like a Jew? What are you doing? Because you know you never kept the law whenever you were trying. And Paul would go on and he'd talk about, you're trying to observe all these holidays and all of these various things. You know, there's so much preaching out there. I mean, listen... I grew up, one of the reasons that I come against a, me, a works-based message is because the majority of the preaching that I heard growing up was about works-based messages. Amen. You got this wrong with you, you got that wrong with you, you got this wrong with you, so now you got to read this much, you got to go to church this much, you got to pray in tongues this much, you got to do this this much, you got to be involved in this ministry and this, that, and that, and then, oh, you need to come up to the front, the man of God's going to lay his hands on you, then you fall down, and you're going to get back up and everything's going to be healed. Mm -hmm. They don't work. It's not, it's a message of works. And you, if you don't like that, then you don't like it. I'm telling you the truth. They were people putting their faith and going up to the front, getting their hands laid on, and, and that they would fall out thinking that that's going to be their deliverance. No, Jesus delivered you at Calvary. Amen. And if you think that you going up there and facing that and you're putting your faith in that to bring you deliverance, then you're wrong. And listen to me, preachers are promoting that as the answer to victory. And I'm here to tell you that is a false gospel. It's not the real thing. There's also the truth that whenever it comes to holidays and things of that nature, listen, there's a whole movement in the church right now called the Hebrew Roots Movement. And what they teach you is that you need that it's Christians... That, go, that are wanting to go back to keeping the Jewish feasts. All right? Because they say that because we're not keeping the Jewish feasts, God's not pleased with us. Huh. 
Well, let me just tell you this. I don't have a problem with being aware when the Jewish feasts are taking place. You know me. I'll, like, I'll preach about the Jewish feast. I love preaching about the Jewish feast because it unfolds Jesus to us. I don't even have a problem if you got the money to fly to Israel to go see what it looks like during the Feast of Tabernacles that just ended whenever they're building all those booths. As a matter of fact, if you got enough money, bring me along because I'd like to go check it out for myself. The problem that you're going to run into is, is that if you think you got to go live in a booth for seven days in order to please God. Amen. The problem is, is that you thinking that you got to keep the Passover in order to please God. That is not how you're going to please God. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those types of the festivals. But yet they have people that are preaching that kind of stuff and they're causing confusion in the midst of the body of Christ. And they don't understand how to get victory because they are buying into a false gospel. I need to hurry. Galatians 4, 17 through 20. We're still talking about a false gospel. We're talking about the enemy's deception. We're talking about nobody's immune. We're talking about even the mature can be deceived. And here the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, 17 through 20, they, the false teachers, zealously affect you, but not well, not for a good purpose. Yeah, they would exclude you that you might affect them. The word affect means desire. They would preach to you a false message. I wrote that Greek word up there because I've seen, so, like I watch a lot of different teachings. I get a lot of good stuff out of a lot of different people. But one of the things that I've noticed here lately is everybody's using all these Hebrew words even whenever they're talking about New Testament stuff. I'm like, come on, dude. What, I don't understand. What, what does this have to, why do you feel like you have to keep using Hebrew words when you're talking about New Testament terminology that's actually Greek that, where it's written from? Because I think, personally, and I mean, maybe that's why I write words like that up there, because I want you to think I'm smart. And I think, personally, these people want people to think that they're smart. Oh, he knows words I don't know. Oh, man, he's so smart. But at the same time, they're bringing in doctrine that is not of the Lord. Telling people that they got to keep these feast days, and it's not of the Lord. You don't have to keep the feast days. Jesus Fulfilled the feast days. Yeah. You don't have to be circumcised if you don't want to, Titus. Jesus is your circumcision. He cut away that old flesh through the shedding of blood. He made you holy and clean before the eyes of God. Yeah. That's the gospel. So, but, but yet they want you to desire them. That's one of the things that false teachers will do. They will approach you. They will, call, they will give you something that appeals to your flesh and make you desire to go to them. But the problem is, is that if you follow after their pernicious ways, they're going to exclude you from the truth. That's what he says. False teachers of false gospel will always appeal to people's flesh. Here Paul warns that the false teachers are passionately attempting to get the Galatian believers to follow their teachers at the expense of excluding them from the truth. Point number two. The gospel of Jesus gives power over this present evil age. Galatians 2.16 says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The word justified means to be declared by God as innocent. Amen. You've been declared by God as innocent. Yes. Why? Through faith. Yes. Not through works. Not through what you did. Through faith in what? Through faith that I go live in a booth for something? No, through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. Yes. God says innocent. Yes. Based upon you believing in my plan. Not only are you innocent now, but it gives you access to grace. Yes. What is grace? I hope you don't get tired of this. I know I used to give this definition a lot. A divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. Don't spend too much time on that. I wrote it down like this. Grace is God's divine power doing for me what I can do for myself. Yes. Amen. Amen. God doing for me what I can't do for myself. I can't fix it. I can't, I can't get it done. Dad, I'm sorry. I can't get it done. <laughs> it's not happening. 
sin in my own strength. My own plans are failing me each and every time. God, I need your grace because you're justified because you put faith in my son and now your sin problem has been dealt with. You have access to my grace and in my grace I do an inside job. My Holy Spirit starts to work on the inside of you and produce in you what you couldn't produce for yourself. He's going to deliver you from this present evil age. He's going to deliver you from the power of Satan that is trying to destroy the lives of human beings. That's what the enemy wants to do. Galatians chapter 2 verses 19 through 21. He says, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Can you back up one real quick? Please look at this. I am crucified with Christ. I wanted you to see that. So you're justified, you're no longer guilty, but not only that, your old man died with Jesus. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, because see, when my faith is in Christ and his work on the cross, my old man's been crucified with Jesus and I'm no longer under law's righteousness. Instead, sin and the law have been dealt with at the cross, so in God's eyes I'm righteous, I have access to his grace to strengthen me in the power of evil. Look at this. This is a good point. The power of evil has no control over my life. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. What is that? That's the law. Blotting out the law. That was against us. The law called us guilty. It was against us. We couldn't keep it. We kept failing every time we promised. Every time we woke up in the morning, we promised God, not going to do it today, God. And we did it anyway. We kept failing God. It was contrary to us. He took it out of the way. He took what? The law out of the way. How did he do it? By nailing it to his cross. Look, look at the next verse. It says, and he spoiled principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He spoiled them. That means he defeated them. Who did he defeat? The powers of evil. How did he do it? Through the cross. He triumphed over them in it. His sacrificial death paid the penalty for sin that allowed you and I to be justified, that gave us access to grace. And the grace of God not only changes us on the inside, but gives us power over the evil one in the midst of this present evil age. Amen. So here we are back to where we began. Galatians 4, 21 through 26 talked about the fact that there were two women, two sons, we're closing with this. He says, tell me you that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid. She, she was a slave. That's what the word bondmaid means. She was a slave. He's using this as an allegory. One produces a child of slavery. The slave produces slavery. He says the other one by a free woman, Sarah. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. The first birth of Ishmael was a natural birth that was born under the power of sin and born under the righteousness of the law because until you were born again, you did not have the grace of God working in your life. He says, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants. The one was from Mount Sinai, which produces bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai. He's describing Hagar as the mountain where the law was given. The first birth, the first covenant, the, first, the, the covenant of flesh, law, traditions that can't be kept. He says, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is. Jerusalem down below, you're talking about the physical Jerusalem that was in bondage. Why? Because the Jewish people were still trying to live for God at this time according to the sacrifices. This is before the temple was destroyed. It's kind of like a lot of information involved in all that. But they were still trying to live according to the law. And because of that, they were still in bondage. He says, uh, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. 
the Jews that continue to try to live their life that way are going to remain in bondage. Christians that are going to continue to live according to a set rules of laws or trying to keep feast days or trying to do all this stuff that try to add righteousness to their faith are going to find themselves in bondage. He says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free. She is the mother of us all. She gives us freedom. Now, one of the things that I wanted to say is, is that if this right here is Mount Sinai, and this is the heavenly Jerusalem. In order to live here, you gotta you gotta disregard this mountain here, <laughs> Mount Calvary. Amen. If you're gonna live, remain on Sinai where the law was given, and you're not gonna come to this place, that means you're gonna have to forget about that other mountain, which was Calvary, That's which right. was the place where the cross was, That's which right. is the place where Jesus died. Amen. Real quick, the first birth, Ishmael, was born in the flesh or physical. And in our first birth in Adam, we were born into this physical world and into this present evil age. But the second birth was our supernatural birth. Just as Isaac was born through the power of God in the new covenant, faith in Jesus causes us to be born of the spirit of God. And we are delivered out of this present evil age. So that was my title, Who's Your Mama? Right? The first covenant. Hagar, the first wife, which was the law, or the second covenant, Sarah, which bring, is the, that's right, the wife of promise, which brought grace. The second wife produces children that are free. The first wife produces children of bondage. How does this affect me today? What are you dealing with in your life? You need to understand that whatever you're dealing with in your life, that if you're born again, You've been born again from above by God. You have access to grace to strengthen you and give you power over the bondage and lies that Satan wants to deceive this present evil age with.